Welcome back to the Mining Pod for this week's news roundup with Matt Kimmel of CoinShares. We talk about hash price difficulty, miners seeking relief from debt, Nidig laying off 33% of its staff, Luxor Technologies' new hash rate derivative, and Brains releasing Stratum V2. Okay, welcome back. Another week, news roundup. Let's do this, Matt. We got a lot of things on the deck. We got difficulty, hash price. So we're going to talk about some debt restructuring, which I think we've talked about like every week in a row. This week, we're talking about uh, Argo and Stronghold Digital. And then we're going to go talk about NYDIG, laying some people off. That was some big news that dropped last night from the Wall Street Journal. We'll finish up with some conversations more technical about Luxor releasing a hash rate derivative product and brains eking closer to Stratum V2. There's a working product now working with Spiral BTC. Hot news week. Hot news week. Big developers, bear market development. We'll start off with hash price and difficulty though. Yeah, so hash price, dollar per terahash, second per day, right? A measure of industry-wide mining revenue. It hit its lowest point ever, right? So cash flow issues across the mining space. Uh, we've seen difficulty increase over 33% this year. We've seen price sort of Bitcoin price sort of steady out, but it has decreased significantly this year as well. That is affecting how much money miners are generating on an ongoing basis. We're going to see it throughout the, the stories this week, um, but it just is evidence of continuing challenging market conditions for miners. Well, what do you got? And great, 13% last week, as most people listening to the show probably knew about. And then another 5% is expected to come up after this period. So we have about another week or so until that happens. Uh, You know, it's expected. We've been talking about it for a while. S19 XPs are coming online. And then we're going to see, I think, some reprieve when a lot of these older generation machines are getting priced out and they're getting pretty close to it. Uh, But we can leave that there. That's a good point. I'll just I'll just add briefly because I was running some numbers earlier this week. If you're at six cents per kilowatt hour, which historically is kind of like a relatively high power price, but lately with um, energy prices it's rising right sort of globally, yeah, a lot of miners are sort of a, at that. And if you're if you're they're buying spot in their local area, they're probably higher than that. If you're not running a machine past the sort of S17 series, F M30 series, if, if it's what's minor, um, you are cash flow negative on your machines, right? If you're not beyond that point. So if you're on S19, of course, you're doing all right. But if you have older generation hardware, if you have an S9, like you better have like two and a half cent, three cent per kilowatt hour, which is super, super cheap. Okay, let's talk about some debt restructuring. So this pairs nicely with the last topic because we have a squeeze, right? Energy prices are going up. And at the same time, difficulty is also going up. So we have miners caught in the middle. And this is just how Bitcoin mining works. And a lot of these public miners took out a lot of debt over the bull market in order to increase their foothold on the network itself. I don't know if that was a good idea or not. I think we'll see who's the best at that in the next... 12 months or so. We're already seeing it happening right now. Some of these miners were able to access really great financing and get a lot of miners online or have future deployments in uh, in the roster. But some other people were not as great, right? They have a lot of debt in their balance sheets. So the first one we're going to talk about is Stronghold, which is cutting costs by getting rid of a deal with Northern Data for profit share. And then they're also cutting some other debt on their balance sheet uh, that's related to Northern Data. And then the other miner we're going to talk about is Argo blockchain, which raised $27 million to ease liquidity pressures. Shares also plunged on the news. They sold about 3,400 S19s to raise cash as well, which is a move we've seen them do this summer a few times, sell some ASICs in order to get some money back on their balance sheet. These two miners, nothing really speaking against them at all, but it is just sort of where they're at. And it's where a few other miners, Bitfarms and Greenage, even Core and Iris as well are some miners with some significant debt problems. Uh, can they get through it? More than likely, but we don't quite know yet. Your initial take on this? 
Yeah. So we were talking about income levels decreasing in the last story segment. This is kind of evidence of that seeing miners' decisions having cash flow issues. Stronghold just restructured about a month ago with NIDIG and sent in lieu of cash like 26,000 ASICs, right? And now they're sort of terminating their deal with Northern Data, doing the same thing, sending some ASICs in lieu of cash. You know, we're seeing sort of a strategy there of off um, selling some machines, some assets that are, uh, you know, typically a little less uh, liquid off their balance sheet um, because they need cash to fulfill their liabilities, right? And we're seeing Argo, right, diluting shareholders by 27 million. Is what's really interesting and unique about this story is a, a single strategic investor did this entire raise. They now have about 15% of outstanding shares. So that was wild to me. But they're also sold about 3,400 machines. So it, to me, this feels like these sort of miners in this really struggling time. There's like a ship sinking. It's still sinking. They're kind of jumping off, swimming towards a, a life raft sort of thing, right? Selling all these machines. But you know, while in distressed market conditions, if you look at ASIC prices, they're down significantly. Um, I think I think like around seventy percent since last year at this time, and so you know maybe the strategy is okay if they're willing to take these machines in lieu of cash, we can then buy them back in a month or two as these prices are going to continue to go down. I don't know, so maybe that metaphorical life raft is kind of deflated a little bit, but it it just seems like this is they're they're reaching for cash these companies right they need it. Yeah, the interesting thing for me is like the public model. So Argo lost about 50% of its stock over the week just based on this move. Markets did not react very favorably to it. And that's going to happen for a lot of these miners that are publicly listed. They have to put out their debt information. And then we also know exactly how much Bitcoin they're mining because they put out these updates. It's all public. It's all transparent. And you're going to see some punishment in capital markets. The worst thing that can happen in this in these cases is that you basically get delisted from an exchange because you don't have a high enough share price. It's unlikely that's going to happen right now for any of the miners we're talking about. It could possibly happen if bear market gets worse and they keep diluting against their shareholders. Definitely something to be cognizant of. But at the very least, it just shows you that public markets, they are very aware that you are uh, low with cash. Let's keep moving on. Let's talk about NIDIG though. This is a huge headline that came out last night. So according to the Wall Street Journal, NIDIG laid off about one third of its staff in September, uh, 110 people uh, as of September 22nd. This comes after they actually did a big raise. They raised about $700 million for a Bitcoin institutional fund, and they reshuffled their executive deck with the CEO and president going back up to the actual owner of NIDIG, and then new people stepping into the role of CEO and president at NIDIG. So not quite like the CEO and president were fired, they actually just moved back to some different roles uh, at the company that owns Nidig. But definitely not a great sign when you're having to reshuffle the leadership board and then you have a layoff right after that. Nidig, Nidig is a really interesting company because it works in so many different aspects of Bitcoin. They're trying to add Bitcoin to banks. They're trying to create some retail products as well. And then they're a big Bitcoin mining lender. It's not uncommon to see NIDIG uh, involved in like a, a financing round for Bitcoin miners. This one sucks though. Like this is a decent amount of people, 110 people. This is one of the largest layoffs we've seen for Bitcoin companies. For other companies like shitcoin companies, we've definitely seen a lot of larger layoffs, but this is a pretty large one. Yeah, we just saw there was a, after the merge, there was a staking pool, right? That also laid off a bunch of its employees, including some of its executives. We talked about that the other week. But this, yeah, the story is ongoing layoffs, right? I guess my spicy take um, maybe is that there could be sort of a contagion effect of all of these uh, difficult conditions in the, in the, for miners as far as how much cash flows they're generating on an ongoing basis, maybe going into the lending space, right? And um, NIDIG is one of those key lenders, and it is only one of their business lines. So we're not going to you know, say this, this is a complete driver of this decision. Um, but in the last story as well, we saw uh, the deal sort of eliminated with Northern Data, the hosting provider, and sort of hosting providers may also um, get hurt because of the uh, miners aren't be able to sort of fulfill all their payments in the in their agreements. Right? There's also rising electricity prices, and so if they had sort of bad contract deals, um, they could be hurt on that end too. I.e., 
you know, chapter 11 filing by Compute North uh, two weeks ago. So the the issues of the mining space sort of are larger than just prop hashers themselves, right? It may go off into the lending and hosting provider space. For sure. And let's like a, take a look at IDIG's information right now on their financing to date. According to Crunchbase, they've raised $1.4 billion in total funding. And this doesn't even include the $720 million they just raised for a Bitcoin investment fund. And that fund, it doesn't, I don't believe it's actually closed yet. I think they just had a filing. And so they're just letting uh, the SEC know about that raise. I think it could be ongoing, but they've raised to date $1.4 billion. Uh, that billion dollar round came in December of 2021. So pretty large. West Cap led that round. And the, the goal really was to bring Bitcoin to banks. It was to integrate Bitcoin into banks. They wanted to integrate Bitcoin straight into whatever broker or bank account you use so you can just purchase Bitcoin. But that hasn't really happened. It's really difficult to get these banks to do anything. So this is a huge layoff. The, the last question I have for you actually on this, Matt, is why do people raise these huge rounds and then let people go during a bear market? It's I, I get it for startups. Like There's some mistakes. But nidig has been around since 2016. They have a lot of funding. It just seems odd that they lay off so much of their staff. I can only speculate in that, you know, they're also sort of rolling over some of their top level management positions that they're kind of strategically pivoting, maybe. You know, they're raising a bunch of money, but they may they may sort of decide to point that towards different initiatives. I know they just started up a sort of incubator for the lightning space um, to try to propel some uh, development in that area. And so they may just be sort of leaning up, trimming some of the areas of the business that they don't necessarily see um, as enhancing their strategic initiatives moving forward. It's good. It's good stuff right there. You should be VC. Okay, let's talk about <laughs> Luxor and Brains to finish it up. You got all those buzzwords. I love it. They're pivoting. Okay, They're pivoting. Luxor has released a hash rate derivative. It's still basically in beta phase. It's an over-the-counter non-deliverable forward contract for Bitcoin mining hash rate. I actually had the head of derivatives over at Luxor come on the, the mining pod. We're going to be releasing that either next week or the week after. And basically talking about how they develop this, it's interesting because there are a lot of derivatives out there for energy and there's decent ones for Bitcoin right now. But miners have been looking for a hash rate derivative for quite a while. Uh, basically enabling miners to sell hash rate into an open market and then someone who wants exposure to Bitcoin mining to be able to go and purchase that hash rate. Any takes on this one? Yeah, I can just I can just feel uh, Chris Ben Dixon's presence, my sort of mentor in the mining space scream how excited he is about hash rate uh, expanding as, a, as an asset class. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is exciting because it's been in development for so long. It's just really difficult to create these sort of markets. Um, I guess what, what's cool about this is that it allows miners to sort of lock in some mining revenue. Um, and then if you don't have sort of physical exposure, you're not actually hashing, say you're, you're some sort of hedge fund that wants exposure to the space and sort of the upside, you can then buy one of these contracts that a miner sells. Um, so that's, you know, that's interesting. And, and this is like very much so uh the importance of the futures sector in the commodity space in general, right? And we know that Bitcoin may be best classified as sort of a synthetic commodity um, where miners are the producers, right? And so it's it's interesting. I think it's cool. I'm excited to see if how much demand there is for this product. I should say for the record that Luxor is both the facilitator of the orders and the pricing agent on these financial instruments. And so there is a decent amount of counterparty risk that is not necessarily there in, in a lot of other markets. So I would like to see some other hash rate derivative marketplaces sort of step up or other data providers to help um, these financial in instruments so you don't rely so much on Luxor itself. But this is a step forward, right? In um, the asset class that is hash rate. Love that. Yeah, the way that Matt described it on the podcast is that a hash rate is compute. It's commoditized compute. And so they're just trying to create a marketplace for that. And the OTC handling of that is still very much so like any other OTC trade in crypto right now, which is like a lot of Telegram heavy, just email conversations. And they're going to build out some sort of future product that's a little bit more 
institutionalized. Uh, but the interesting thing about that is it basically mirrors how all OTC desks work in crypto right now. Everything still relies on good old Telegram. Okay, let's move to the last topic. Brains is working with Spiral Brains. BTC. Brains. Uh, working with Spiral BTC, which is a subsidiary of Block, formerly known as Square, uh, to put out an implementation of Stratum V2. This is the first upgrade to Stratum V2 since 2019. Uh, Brains, of course, has been running Stratum V2 since then, but there's been a few key issues with Stratum V2 that have not been fixed yet, including job negotiation for miners. So this is a large update. They're inviting people to come and test out the new update. And they also have this working group with Spiral BTC and I think a few other companies, which is notable. Yeah, I mean, here, the sort of cypherpunk Bitcoin proponents that are sort of, it's all about decentralization, it's all about censorship resistance, should be pumping their fist in the air and getting excited about Stratum V2. Um, These sort of key benefits that I would say is from a security perspective, um, data is sort of encrypted between the, in in transit between mining pools and miners, that wasn't um, a component of the Stratum V1 protocol. There's sort of censorship resistance um, in the respect that miners themselves can sort of create the block template. That means they can choose which transactions and which order those transactions go in the blocks that they produce. Um, and then also, what do I got here? Let me let me consult the notes. Check out the, the um, good notes there. Yeah, I need to check out the good. Oh, the the efficiency gain. So there's sort of better support for proxy servers. Um, and so instead of each individual miner sort of communicating with the pool, you can sort of batch that together, right? And so it's sort of a speed efficiency. And where I really think it's going to be helpful is maybe some miners in those really remote areas that don't have strong um, internet connections, right? They can actually, you know, sort of not drop their messages uh, and sort of do it all in one go, right? I suspect that there'll be a real gradual sort of adoption of stratum v2 because there's not a strong market driver for people to adopt um we've seen this in bitcoin innovations if you think about how long it took segwit to really get adopted and like taproot currently right if there's not that strong market incentive the people in low connectivity areas will probably upgrade first but i would think you know maybe a censorship level attack at the mining level maybe a man in the middle sort of security attack those could be catalysts to really propel Stratum V2 forward. Um, but I don't necessarily see it being a, you know, an immediate major spike impact. Yeah, to your point on incentives, I think that the only reason you have incentives to do this is if it decreases pool fees. If you go from like paying 2% to a pool to nothing, that would be pretty great. Even if you're using brains right now, though, there is actually like it's sort of a hidden fee within it where you, there's like this developer fee that goes to the brains team for developing their software. You don't have like a pool fee, but there is like that that dev fee kind of sort of baked in there. And I don't know if this Stratum V2 implementation has that. I think with the Stratum V2 right now, you have to use brains in order to use their implementation of Stratum V2, but I'm not familiar with it as of this update. But I think that's a good note on incentives. Things only happen because it's cheaper for people and they want to move over to it. And then of course, if it's going to be cheaper, then you have to have some motivation like, probably need volume or you want to move over because you think like the UI is e- easier to use. But a lot of people still choose to use Binance pool or Ant pool or something else, right? And why? Well, I mean, the brains is there and you don't have to pay f- that pool fee, but people still choose to use it for whatever reason. Good note on incentives to close out. Cool. We're going to the weekend. Any words of wisdom for us, Matt? Try to stay hashing. Stay hashing, my friends. I wish you the stay best. Hashing. There we go. Cool. See you next week.